Welcome to our online service. My name is Keith and I'm the lead pastor at Grace Fellowship. I wanna thank you for joining us. If you're new to Grace, we'd love to connect with you and answer any questions that you may have. We know entering a new place, especially a church, can be challenging and uncomfortable, and we wanna make your first visit to one of our in-person campuses as easy as possible. You can fill out the plan of visit form to let us know you're coming, and our team will be sure to meet you at the door, show you around, and answer any of your questions. If you're watching on our website, there's a chat bubble in the bottom right corner of your screen where you can connect with a real person to answer any questions that you have. Now let's transition to our service. Well, we are so glad that you are here with us tonight. What's true is we have a lot to be thankful for. So let's begin by praising our God. Would you stand and sing with us tonight? Let's sing out to Him. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. Like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are up now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our Because this is our God, this is who He is, He loves us. And this is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He pulled the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus.
Amen. We're going to keep singing so you can stay standing, but uh, we want to take a moment in service and, and stop and recognize and celebrate uh, last weekend that we got together as a church for Easter to celebrate our risen Savior. And uh, I want to just share some of what God did last week that I think will encourage you. And so I want to ask you to hold your applause because I trust as you hear these, you'll be encouraged, especially if this is your church or if you are a believer. It was the highest attended service we've ever had as a church. About 7,300 people across our campuses came and heard about Jesus. We're not even holding the applause because we're so excited. I love it. You can clap. It's great. It's great. We asked people during service, hey, if this is your like first time going, I want to follow Jesus, then let us know. And 119 people did that. We have about 70 people. We have about 70 people who said, I'm not ready to do that yet, but I'll explore some questions at uh, your church and, and have a conversation. So they're signed up for Explore. We're going to Monday, uh, walk through that with them. And so, um, man, one of the really cool things too is we had a lot of people here last Easter that weren't here because they're at Lithopolis. And Lithopolis had its first Easter and had over 700 people there. And so people respond. And so let's just celebrate together again what God did at Easter. And, and for a moment, I want to say to y'all, like, especially if this is your church, thank you if you served, if you prayed, if you invited, like you were a part of this. This is what God does through his people. And so we're excited to be a part of that. But we want to make sure we do this all the time as a church where we give praise where praise is due. And that obviously is to our God, that he's the one who changes hearts. He's the one who moves. He is the one who deserves the glory. So let's just for a moment together as a church, just pray and thank God for what he's doing, for what he's done and what he will continue to do. So let's pray together this evening. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. God, that, that we know we're just a, a single church in multiple locations and the stories we have to tell about how you moved are, are incredible. And so God, we thank you for the way you used this Easter season here and a bunch of other places for your glory and your fame. And God, I pray we'd never get tired of doing that as a church. God, that we'd stay on mission to try to help people meet you, but also Lord, that each of us individually would keep bringing our lives to you, keep serving you and following you and walking with you. And so Lord, we thank you, we praise you. And even tonight, Lord, I pray that each person here would right now in this moment, just ask you to speak to them. God, that they would just seek you in this moment, even if they're far from you right now and they just don't even know why they walked in the door tonight, God. Would they just know that you're here, that you're present, that you love them, that you have something to say to them. So Lord, thank you for what you did last week. And we pray even right now that you would move in this space tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Jake said, we're, we're right on the heels of, of Easter. And being able to be reminded what Jesus did on the cross for us and that it, that it didn't end there, that he defeated the grave. And, and when we understand that, when we accept that, then we know that Jesus is better than anything. And we wanted to take some time tonight just to introduce a new song. And, and that's all it's about, is that Jesus is better than anything. He's better than everything. In your sorrows, in your doubts, in your victories, Jesus is better. And he's Lord over everything. And so we're gonna sing this chorus together We'll sing through the rest of the song. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him. this our prayer today.
Out of us, you can go ahead and have a seat. Deep down, we all believe in things that guide our life. It's our concept of what's true. It's faith, whether we call it by that name or not. For Christians, the cornerstone of faith is the resurrection of Jesus. It's a story celebrated globally at Easter a belief that defies the laws of nature, yet is embraced as truth. But here's the surprising fact. Many who say they believe barely see its impact on their daily lives. That's the disconnect. If Jesus truly conquered death, wouldn't everything be different? Wouldn't it change the way we approach all of life? What we pursue, our sense of purpose, what we love, what we fear, and what we don't have to fear anymore. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes, and every single person alive owes it to themselves to ask, what does it change for me? Grace, great to see you this weekend. I'm really glad that you are here. I especially wanna welcome you. If you are someone that came to Easter and maybe you don't normally come to church, but you came back, uh, that's awesome. And it means a lot. You picked a great weekend because we're going to start a conversation that I think is a really important conversation uh, over the next few weekends here at Grace. So what we do is we take a topic or an idea or a book of the Bible, a concept, and we spend some time thinking about that. And we're going to do that for the next several weeks uh, around a specific idea. Uh, there have been times in your life where whether it's a family member or a friend, uh, or maybe it's uh, uh, someone that's an expert in a, an area or a field, or maybe the government has come to you and they've said with a loud voice, this is what is, this is the way that it is. And they've voiced something. Uh, for some of us, uh, somebody in our life watched a documentary about uh, how chickens are taken care of before they're killed. And then they just went on like a speech to you about how you should never eat chicken and definitely chicken nuggets. And they went all in on that thing and they made you feel a certain kind of way about that. For some people that's around like policy and education or whatever it is. Uh, but ultimately you can tell that they feel a certain way about a thing. And part of you just kind of goes, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Do I care? Am I going to go all in? How do, how do I process all that? And for those of us that are Christians, in fact, billions of us all around planet Earth last weekend, uh, we celebrated Easter. And when we did, uh, we laid out the Christian claim, like a really big Christian claim. And it's this Christian claim right here that the resurrection of Jesus proves he is God. 
That's what we said through Easter. That's what Easter is all about, is declaring that that's the case. And we talked about, we celebrated this audacious claim. We said that a dead guy was really dead, that he, he said he was God. He said he was sinless like God. He predicted his death and then he died and then he rose again and he did all that. And we believe that by faith and not just by faith. We actually believe there are reasons to believe that. And so the resurrection of Jesus, this guy being dead, coming back to life, proves he is God. Now, for those of us that are Christians, we go, yes, and that changes everything. But for many people in the world, even if they would submit to this, even if they would believe this, there's a so what quality to it. What what does this mean? What am I supposed to do with this? My my mentor was telling me a story one time when he was in college. He went to a, a, a Uh, secular university and he was in a class and he was really serious about his faith and he went to the professor after the class and he had this long conversation with the professor over multiple times and told the professor about Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead. And the professor heard it and heard it over multiple times and then finally looked at my friend and said this, great, Jesus resurrected from the dead, so what? So what? What does that mean? And, And there's a reality that for those of us that are Christians, we would say, not only does it mean everything, we would say all of us should wrestle with this because... If Jesus really is God in the flesh, it means that there's a real God, it means he's alive, and it means he said things very specifically about your life and about my life. And so what that leads us to do is to take some weeks for us to think about this as a church, the so what nature of Jesus being God. And here's what we wanna do over the next few weekends here at Grace. We wanna ask a few questions and deal with this. So who is this Jesus? What are some aspects about this Jesus? And what does he want both for me and from me? If Jesus really is God, well then who is this God? Who is this Jesus? And what does he want for me? What's he actually gonna give me as God? Or what does, how does he wanna serve me? How does he want me then to live and respond to all of that? And so we're gonna talk about how does this idea impact me on the day to day or how should it impact me if I believe it? And so for many of us, this will be like great reminder. Uh, it will refresh our importance of understanding Jesus and how that impacts us. For others of us, this is us considering the claim. If Jesus is God, who is he and what does that mean for my life, All right? With that said, let's, let's get cracking on this week. So I don't remember how many years ago, it was a handful of years ago uh, with our four kids, particularly the oldest, we started allowing, you know, them to stay home alone. So whether it was we allowed our oldest boy to stay home alone first and then our oldest girl and then them with the twins. And then we started incorporating the word babysitting, like you're gonna babysit while Kel and I are gone or while we're off doing stuff or whatever. And when we introduced the term babysitting and when we started leaving them home, particularly with the twins, the younger twins, uh, the twins, we, we started hearing something that I remember when I was a kid and my parents started leaving my brother and sister and I alone. We started hearing this question, this language, this talk a lot when we were getting ready to leave the house. And it, and it went like this. So who's in charge? <laughs> who's in charge? It, it, is my brother in charge of me or, or is he just in charge of the twins? Are we both in charge? Who's in charge? Who gets to make the calls? Who gets to say what we're doing with the dishes? Who gets to say when it's bedtime? How does all of that play out? And I can remember them saying things like, are they the boss of me or am I the boss of them? Is anybody the boss of anybody? I can remember when my parents would come home when I was that age and I would go and I would like beat my brother and sister to the door and I would tattle on my brother and sister and I would say they did this. You need to go in there and you need to tell them they're not the boss of me. They're not the boss of me. I'm fine. They're not the boss of me. Did you tell them? Are you the boss of me? You're not the boss of me. Right? And then my kids do the same thing. We're out on a date and the, the phone just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. FaceTime. Middle of the date. Tell them they're not the boss of me. Tell them, they don't get to tell me that. And then they're fighting and then Kel and I are at date night and we're mad, we never wanna go on a date again. We wanna leave our kids, all that kind of stuff, right? Now, there's part of us that we're like, they're kids, that's cute, whatever it is, they argue about that stuff. But let's be honest, this idea of who the boss of me never goes away. Because something that is intuited in all of us and something that we're all after, something that I think is safe to say is this reality right here. We want to be in charge when we want to be in charge. We want to be in charge when we want to be in charge. 
I don't need to know you to know this is true. That when you want to be in charge, you want to be in charge. So if you want to be in charge at work, you want to be in charge at work. If you want to be in charge of the team, you want to be in charge of the team. You love, we all love freedom and control. We're all fans of it. Even when we don't want to be in charge and we let someone else be in charge, that's a way of being in charge. Because we didn't want to be in charge. So I'll name you, you're in charge. Which really meant I was in charge of you being in charge and I was still in charge because I got what I wanted. I got to control the situation. And this happens all the time. It happens in power dynamics at your job, with your friends, with your family. It happens with players and coaches. It even shows up in church. Some of you are like, you know, you, you teach in, um, in, in small groups or grace groups or you, and, and, and like we come as a church and we say, this is what you're gonna lead in your grace group. This is what you're gonna talk about for a few weeks. Ain't nobody telling me what I'm talking about in my group. Talk about what I want in my group. Happens in church, you're gonna park in this spot. I'll park where I wanna park. I don't care what they do out there. <laughs> happens in church. You know how it happens in church? Happens in church in certain services at certain campuses when we tell you you're gonna sit in that seat and we usher you to it. My church, I'll sit where I wanna sit. Nobody telling me to go where I wanna go because I wanna be in charge when I wanna be in charge. And I get it, I get it. I wanna be in charge when I wanna be in charge. And there's a reason for this, right? There's, a, there's something underneath this that we all kind of sense and we feel and we're all kind of this way. And, and here's what it is, ready? We, we think this, we think that we know best. We think we know best. The reason my kids wanna be in charge is because they think they know best. They definitely think they know more than their sibling. They think they know where to sit. We think we all know what to teach. We know when to go to bed, what to eat, when to work, how hard to work. If we should have a conversation, if they're the right friend, if they're the wrong friend, what's right, what's wrong, what to invest money in, we think we know. We think we're right. And so we wanna be in charge. We wanna be in charge because we know what we should do. And so we're just gonna govern it and say that we're gonna do it. And so here's the problem though. And you know this, you're not always in charge. And you know what's really hard in life? What's really hard, the conflict is this, is when you meet moments in life where it's like this, I wanna be in charge and I'm not. This is what's really hard. It's because you wanna be in charge when you wanna be in charge because you think you know best, but then there's moments where you wanna be in charge and you're not. They didn't give you the promotion and you're not the boss and you're not what the coach thought you were gonna be and you're not all that. And so you're, you're not in charge and you don't get to do that. My parents are wrong, the government's wrong. My older siblings are stupid. I just know, and I should be in charge. They should have asked me. I should get to make the call. But you didn't get to make the call. And nobody likes this. Nobody likes this. Doesn't, this, this isn't a Jesus thing yet. Just nobody likes this. But this is where it becomes a Jesus thing. Is if Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he's God, we have to look at who is God and what does he say about himself and how does he describe us and how does he describe him? And here's, here's some things that Jesus says about following him. He says, if you wanna find your life, you have to lose your life. Jesus says things like, your heart is deceitful beyond all understanding. Jesus shows up and he says, um, if you wanna be first, you have to be last. J Jesus shows up and he says, um, what I'm gonna need you to do is I'm gonna need you to take up your cross every day and die to yourself. And then, and then one of the titles that comes for this Jesus who resurrected is the title Lord. It's over 300 times, depending on how you look at it in the New Testament, how you connect it to the Old Testament, because in the Greek it's, it's translated or it's, it's the word kyrios that's translated Lord in the New Testament. It's most often used of Jesus when it's referring to him being resurrected. It's also translated in the Old Testament a lot of times, Lord, when they took the, the Hebrew and they translated it into Greek and then they translated it into English and they would translate Jehovah, Yahweh oftentimes into Lord. And what it stands for is the supremacy of this person. Lord means master. It means owner. It's often a term that was used for landlords, for people who own something. It's a word of authority. It's a word of position. It's an authoritative word. And the Bible says this Jesus who went into the ground and rose again, if you wanna follow him and you wanna know him and you wanna understand who he is and what he wants for you and from you, you have to begin to interact with him as Lord. And Lord means 
you're not in charge of your life. And we've already said, I wanna be in charge when I wanna be in charge. And what we don't like is when I wanna be in charge and I'm not. And Jesus says, when you sign up to follow him, he's Lord, not just Lord. He's Lord of Lords. He's King. He's authority. He's above all things. And what this means is that if you say, I guess I believe Jesus resurrected from the dead and I want to follow that Jesus and I'm in and I want to understand, then what it means is you have to understand you're not in control of your life anymore. You're not in charge. You're not the boss because you follow a Lord. And, and this is way easier said and way easier proclaimed than it is lived. And what we wanna do for a few moments is think about this and look at a, a passage in scripture where Jesus is speaking to people who are religious, people who would say, yes, I'm in on the whole God thing. And what he's going to do is he's gonna to talk to them to make sure that they understand the consistency of one's life and the connection between two things, profession and action, lips and your actual life. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter six, Luke chapter six. And we wanna get after this reality as Jesus is gonna help us come to grips with thinking about what does it mean to follow the Lord who is this resurrected Christ who is God and what does he want for me and from me? Now, Jesus has been talking a, a lot in this particular section of scripture. And if you have a Bible, you'll see like a printed one with red letters that there's a bunch of red here because this is all Jesus talking about all this stuff. And the first part of this sets up the importance of understanding the Lord, but he really wants to get to make sure that you and I understand something about the reality of our life, all right? So here's Luke chapter six, verse 43, and here's what it says. <clears throat> no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Jesus is saying, you know this, that orange trees produce oranges and apple trees produce apples. And so when you begin to look at the person, you'll know them by their fruit, the Bible says about Christians. And he says, if you're a good tree, you'll produce good fruit and a bad tree won't produce good fruit and vice versa. This is just the way that it is. In other words, who you really are is who you really are. And it will be seen by what you do, not by what you say. In fact, he continues to, to deal with this. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. You, you, you know what kind of tree it is because you see the fruit and you go, oh, that's what kind of tree that is. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Like you don't go to the banana tree and go, oh, I want a pineapple. You, you know what it is and you go get it. And he says, when people look at you, they should be able to say, oh, you, I knew you were a Christian long before you ever spoke up because the way you lived and loved and cared and served and the things that your life's about, because Good trees produce good fruit and, and people see that and they know that. And then he continues and he says this to end this part of the section. A good man or a good woman brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. We, we've talked about this so many times here at Grace. That out of the heart, your life is flows. It's how you live, like what's inside of you. And he says, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in their heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Your life lives out what is inside of you. So, okay, whew, Easter, Jesus raised from the dead. Yes, I love Jesus. I want Jesus. I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm in on Jesus. Great. Then here's what he says. Then that profession will be bigger than what you say. It'll be how you live. And why will it be that way? Because Jesus is your Lord and you're not the boss of your life anymore. And whether we like this or not, Jesus shows up and he says, there's things you're supposed to do in your life. In fact, Jesus says this, if you love me, you will obey me. Now, some of us hear that with like a tone that like Jesus is angry. If you love me, you'll obey me. <laughs> no, but he says, if you love me, You'll, you'll obey me, I'm your Lord. You, you know who I am, you know my character, you know what I did for you. And so 
Jesus lays out this like what should be consistency in our life. And then he says this in the next verse, ready? Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me master, master? Why do you call me owner, owner? Why do you call me king, king? And do not do what I say. You're like a married person who says you're married and then you're running around sleeping with people. What are you doing? You're, you're like a person that says you're a fan of this team and you're rooting for that team. What, what are you doing? How can you say that you're with me, that you love me, that you're for me, and you're gonna call me Lord, Master, God, King, and then not do what I say? He's like, that doesn't add up, because why? Because I'm Jesus who rose from the dead, which means I'm God, and part of what it means to be God is that I am Lord. See, one of the challenges, and this, this, I don't know how exactly this happened. I've read a lot about this and I've, you know, I've got my own thoughts about this, but one of the things that happened, particularly in kind of like our North American definition of Christianity is that it was believed that you could sign up to follow Jesus as savior and then maybe someday decide he was your Lord. That ain't nowhere in here. He's God, he's God in the flesh, he's risen from the dead, and he's Lord, Lord, that we should do what he says. And then he gives us a promise and a warning in terms of how we interact with him. So here's what he says in light of that. As for everyone who comes to me, so you say, I'm in, I want Jesus, so what? Okay, you're in, you're following me, I'm Lord, Lord, great. If you come to me and you hear my words and you put them into practice, I'll show you what you're like. So you hear what I've asked you to do, what I've commanded to you. Let me tell you what that person's like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on a rock. And when the flood came and the torrent struck the house, it could not shake it because it was well built. He says this, if you follow me as Lord, Lord, and you do what I say, and you trust my directions and you trust my boundaries and you're obedient to what I'm asking, the world and life are gonna come and they're gonna huff and they're gonna puff and they're gonna try to blow your house down and it's gonna come and it's gonna, it's gonna come. But I'm telling you, if you'll treat me as Lord, Lord, your house is gonna stand. If you treat me as Lord, Lord, if you listen to me and you obey, if you're willing to say, I'm not the boss, you're the boss, Jesus, I'm gonna do what you want. I don't always understand it. It's not always easy. It doesn't always make sense, but I'm in. He goes, great, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna build your life on a firm foundation. And then he says, that's the promise. And then he says, but here's the warning, ready? So he comes back and he says this, but those, the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, ugh, they're like a man or a woman who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. I want Jesus, yes, yes, I do, but I'm not gonna listen to him. I'm just gonna listen to me. I'm gonna still be boss. He goes, great, you know what you're setting your life up for? Destruction. And he's saying that there is a way that your life is revealed by what you do and what you should do is follow him as Lord, Lord. If I was gonna start to boil this down and say, what, what does this mean? Who is this Jesus? And what do we begin to see that he wants for and from me? Here's what we need to know, ready? He is the boss and he knows best. Not just one of those. Not just he knows best and he's not the boss or not just he's the boss, but he doesn't know best. He's the boss and he knows best. He is Lord, Lord, and he knows what is good for your life. You're not in charge of your life. You follow the Lord, listen, of everything, everything that is seen and everything that is unseen, everything that is natural and everything that is supernatural. You follow the Lord who spoke to a storm and it stopped. You also follow a Lord who spoke to the grave and it let him go. You follow a Lord who is the boss of all things. You follow a Lord who shows up and he says, here's what I need you to do. If you're gonna follow me, I'm your Lord, ready? You have to forgive as I have forgiven. Hey, hey, hey what you need to do is you need to accept one another. Hey, you know what you need to do? You, you need to be prayerful in all things. What you need to do is not worry, but by prayer and supplication, give everything to me. You know what you need to do? You need to care that other people would know me. And I'm the boss and I know best and I'm Lord over every single thing. 
Jesus is saying if you obey him, there is a firm foundation. And, and, and you know this. The daily decisions to say, Lord, Lord, I follow you and everything on the daily begin with a time where you first said, he is Lord. He is Lord. Now, here's, here's what I wanna try to get out with this. There's so many, it's just so easy. It's just so easy to say he's Lord and nothing changed. Um, if I was to like right now find like somewhere in this church, a spot where there was like a wire that was loose that had electrical current running through it. And I was to go grab it and I was to bite it. <laughs> Everyone would know that that happened to me. It would be obvious. You would go something powerful, a current ran through him. He looks different. He's talking different. He's smelling different. Because you would have said, I came into contact with something that was powerful that changed me. And it would have been undeniable. Jesus is saying that when you come into contact with me and you see me as Lord, Lord, it should be obvious by the fruit that you possess. It should just be known. It should just be seen. And there's two reasons that's not happening in your life if you actually say that you follow Jesus, but you're not living it out. Number one, you actually don't believe he's boss. You still think you're in charge. Or number two, you know he's the boss, but you're not ready to be obedient to him because you actually think he doesn't know best. I love you. Listen to me. There's not a single command that the Lord has given you that isn't for your good. That's not for your pleasure, for your best, for your purpose, for knowing him more, for his glory, for his fame that is worthwhile. He is the boss, not you. He's Lord and he knows best. And he says, why are you saying I'm Lord, Lord, and then not living like it? Again, if I was gonna put this in a different way, when we think about what he's offering us and who he is and his direction leading to these, such, these good things, here's what I just wanna say. I'll say it a different way, but we need to get this. Jesus is a good king who desires obedience. Who is this God who raised from the dead? Who is this Jesus? And what does he want? He is a good king who desires obedience. There are these, you know, shirts and bumper stickers and memes and various things all over the internet. You know, Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is my co-pilot. Jesus is my, Jesus is my, Jesus is the king. He's the king. He's Lord. And while he wants to be with you and near you and empathize with you and love you and connect with you, Jesus is a good king who desires obedience. What does he want from me? He wants me to follow him. He wants me to listen to him. He wants me to worship him. He wants me to engage him. He's a good king who desires obedience. Two things, two things that I want to get through this passage to make sure that you understand that Jesus was saying. Um, they're really straightforward, but they have just huge ramifications for our life. And I want us to see them. Here's the first one Jesus is saying about, if you want to ignore him, you don't want to see him as boss and you don't want to believe he's best. He says this, decisions have consequences. Decisions have consequences. In the passage, he lays out very clearly, clearly, again, promise and warning. Promise and warning. His illustration or his point is that there's two paths, one with a good foundation, one with a bad foundation. Two people with two different results. What is the basis of the two different results? It's not, did they know what to do? It's whether or not they did it. It's whether or not they put into practice what was going on. The Bible was never meant just to be known. Don't make us hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Allow it to transform my life. And he says, decisions have consequences. In other words, obedience has one path and disobedience has a different path. Which one will it result in? And you need to know this is the way he's designed it. Almost all of you or many of you know that I have a degree in chemistry. And if you have a degree in chemistry from college, it means you've taken a lot of math and you've taken a lot of science. And I got to the point in math in college where at some point all the numbers went away and they just turned into letters. 
And I'm like, what happened? This isn't math anymore. It's no more numbers and it's all letters. I also got far enough in a bunch of science classes where all the letters went away and they turned into numbers. And I found myself sometimes going, I thought I was in a science class. I thought I was in a math class. Now, all that's true. But what's also true is in science and math, one of the reasons I like them is that there's a rhyme and a reason to them. They play out a certain way. There are natural laws. There are created ways that things work. Things in motion tend to stay in motion. Things at rest tend to stay at rest. If you take something, you drop it, gravity gets a hold of it and it goes. A plus B equals C. There are formulas in the way that it results. There are natural consequences and rules and systems in the way God has ordered the world. There are supernatural consequences in the way God has wired the world. If you want, now listen to me, if you want a firm foundation in your life, then listen to God. He is the boss and he knows best. If you want your life to be chaotic and you want to like self implode it and you want to have a bunch of challenges that you don't need to have, then ignore God, even especially when you know what he wants you to do. Now, I'm not saying follow God, life is easy, no problems, peaches and roses, everything's perfect, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is if you want a firm foundation, you wanna make sure life makes sense in the way that you can control it, Jesus says, when you hear me as Lord, Lord, and see me as Lord, Lord, do what I say, because here's what's gonna happen. Yep, it's gonna help make your marriage better. Yep, it's gonna help make your finances better to help make you uh, be able to be more generous. Yep, it's gonna help you know how to invest your time in your kids and lead you better as a parent. But way more than that, and this is so important, I hope that you hear this. Life is hard and life is complicated and things happen. But when you listen to Jesus as Lord and do life his way, your foundation becomes so strong that even if your career is taken from you, you have purpose that is far bigger than that because you have a foundation of Jesus. That if the health report comes back and it's bad, like really bad, it's okay, you have peace because you still have Jesus. That when you see life and you're like, I I don't really know what is next and I'm not sure where to go and it seems like everything I've tried and my kids, you know what? With a foundation of Jesus, there is hope that is bigger than your circumstances. One of the reasons that professing Christians have their lives sometimes without peace and purpose and hope and direction and meaning is because sometimes the people who are, who should know better are doing exactly what they know they shouldn't be doing. And Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do what I say? And then he says, here's the consequence of that. You're gonna have a life that's on a broken foundation. And the storms are gonna come and it's gonna be messy and it's gonna be difficult and your life's gonna get washed away. But listen, I'm the boss and I know best. I'm Lord, so, so listen. And if you don't, and here's, here's what happens. Some of you are like, um, Keith, I've I've rolled the dice on God's commands. I'm all right. I'm all right. Hear this. This is super important. Do not confuse God's patience with you as God's permission to you. God is often being incredibly gracious to you and he doesn't have to be. And his patience with you is not permission for you to keep doing what you're doing. He has said, if you ignore me, decisions have consequences. Number two, number two in this passage, and this is going back to the, to the beginning where he's talking about fruit. Number two is this, behaviors reveal reality. Behaviors reveal reality. Tree is known by its fruit. You can't fake this. Out of the heart, a person lives, either good or bad. The truth will be seen. Your heart is reflecting who you really are. If you start having heart problems, your heart starts getting out of weird rhythms. You start having shortness of breath and you go and you say, doc, I think there's something wrong with my heart. They're gonna, they're gonna give you an EKG or an ECG or a stress test or an MRI. They're gonna do something. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna get images to look at what's really going on in your heart. And they're gonna say, this is what is going on with your heart. Jesus is saying in this passage, if you really wanna know what your heart is like before him is Lord, look at your life. Your life 
is the MRI for what you really believe about whether he's Lord. Your priorities, your decisions, your obedience, your lack of obedience, all of those things. What do you really do when you're raising your kids? What matters most? What do you really do as it relates to stress? Guys, I've, I've been a pastor long enough to know that the Lord is so clear to us, so clear to us about what we're supposed to do with our finances. And our lives are telling the truth about whether or not we see him as Lord in that area. And this, this is not like gonna turn into a money talk, but let me, let me just say this. I've said this before and I'll keep saying it until the Lord changes us to get rid of it. As it relates to our missional generosity in this church, responding to the way the Lord has called us to be Lord, giving him our first and our best the way he has said as Lord, we have a lot of disobedient people, a lot. It gives me no pleasure to say that. And I know that because I own a calculator and I can do math of what it looks like for this many thousands and what we have. And there's a reality, listen to me. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Because he's Lord, he's Lord. And there's a part of, we gotta look at our lives and go, is my life matching my profession? Is my life living out what I say I'm living out? When you become a Christian, there's this bearing of fruit, this formation that should happen. It should show up in lots of ways. You should desire to be with Jesus. You should love God's people. You should have a desire and affection for his word. You should want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. You should begin to hate sin. Listen to me. If those things are not true in your life in increasing measure, he's not Lord. Because he's the boss and he knows best. And it's so easy to say it, but Jesus' point is your behaviors are telling the truth. There's this incredibly terrifying warning in Matthew chapter seven, you guys know this? where Jesus says, there's a bunch of people on judgment day that'll stand before him and they'll say, hey, we're with you. And he's gonna say, yeah, you said, Lord, Lord, but I never knew you because your life really wasn't about me. There's a part of us this weekend that if we go, I believe in Jesus and he resurrected, then I have to say, he is boss and he knows best. And then I have to put up a mirror and ask, does my life show it? And Jesus says, how you're living, it's telling the truth about who you really are. It's a mark of a real relationship that you say, Jesus is boss of every area of my life. And he knows best. As I alluded to earlier, but I just wanna come back and say it again, this bottom line, because there's some of us that we think we can do this. The Bible knows nothing of a Jesus who is not Lord. The Bible knows nothing of a Jesus who is not Lord. If you're not concerned about following Jesus, then you should be concerned about your own salvation. Well, I, I, I don't know another way to say this. If your hope for Jesus is just that he is fire insurance from hell and you're not seeing him as boss who knows best, I would be very concerned that you know that Jesus. If I was to go to a field that had a bunch of venomous snakes and I was to light a fire in that field all of the snakes would go out of that field. They would still be venomous. Your, listen to me, your fear of hell is not the same thing as a love of Jesus. And if you are following Jesus, I love Jesus, I'm in. He resurrected, he's God. So what? God is boss and he knows best. 
And there's no version of the God of the Bible that simply shows up and isn't Lord of my life. And if me or this church has ever propagated that, shame on us. Shame on us. Because it's not the biblical version of Jesus in the Bible. Here's what I want us to do. For this particular week, I want us to memorize this single verse that's in the passage, right? It's this verse that's Luke 646. Because I think it helps us to be reminded that we're not boss, we're not in charge, we're not in control. He's boss and he knows best. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I want you to memorize that this week. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If I follow the Jesus who rose from the dead, he's Lord, he's master, he's owner, he's king. He's a good king who desires my obedience. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This is not the mark of who we should be if we're followers of Jesus, living a Jesus-centered life. We should see him as boss and we should see him as knowing best. And guys, we should want it this way because he's the creator and he knows what's best for his creation. There's a, a, a famous golfer um, named Arnold Palmer and Arnold Palmer, uh, they give him credit for inventing the Arnold Palmer drink. And the Arnold Palmer drink, half lemonade, half unsweetened tea. And ESPN had this commercial one time where Arnold Palmer was making an Arnold Palmer. He was like in this room and there was unsweetened tea and there was lemonade and, and he was pouring it and he was doing half and there were these two people watching him and they were like watching in amazement because the creator was looking and manipulating their creation. And so he finishes making the drink and he walks away and the two people who watched him, they were like, that's awesome. And basically what they were saying was, of course, Arnold Palmer would know how to make an Arnold Palmer. He's the master, he created it. He, he knows what to do, it's his creation. You know what is so interesting to me is that we are God's creation and yet we think we know better than our creator. If there is anyone who knows what's best for our life, it's the one who made us, the one who fashioned us, the one who died for us, the one who loves us, the one who instructs us into life and, and abundance. I know that you and I struggle to say, I wanna be in charge. And yet Jesus says, I'm the boss, but I know best. I'm a good king who desires obedience. And if you wanna roll the dice on that, it's gonna have consequences. And if you think you can follow me and not follow me, then you really don't know me and you're not following me. But if you wanna follow the one who raised from the dead, then he's the boss. And you have to believe he knows best as creator over creation. I wanna ask you all over the church, every campus, just to bow your head. And in this moment, just for you to, to ponder for a second before I pray for us, where are you struggling to make him Lord? If you're a follower of Jesus, where, where are you still holding on to your life? Where would Jesus look at you and say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet not do what I say? And in this moment, I wanna, I wanna ask you through the power of the Holy Spirit to acknowledge that you're not in charge and you need to repent. That he is the king who rose from the grave. He's the boss and he knows best. And that what's going on in your heart, you need to say you're sorry for. And I also wanna remind you that he's faithful and just and good and he will forgive you he will walk with you towards obedience. If you're not a Christian, I just, right now, I want you just to ponder, did he raise from the dead? And if he raised from the dead, am I willing to consider then that that means he's in charge of my life and that he knows best?
Father God, there are many ways you know where in moments and in seasons, you have and could have looked at me and said, Keith, why do you say Lord, Lord and not do what I say? And I'm thankful that in those moments, there's been conviction, there's been grace, there's been forgiveness, there's been mercy, there's been patience. But I also wanna say you are Lord, you do know best, you are God of all. And God, I pray that each of us who are followers of yours would lay down our lives, would live before you with the desired obedience that you deserve and that we would truly live before you as our King. Thank you for your goodness. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's respond by singing together to our Lord and Savior who's worthy of praise.
He's the boss and he knows what's best. And I, I hope you'll take Keith up on the action step of memorizing Luke 6, 46. And as you do to really see where does your life, your behaviors align with that and, and celebrate the times where you actually are following and serving the Lord and maybe repent, turn, process. Why are you holding on to the things that don't align with his lordship, his kingship and his goodness? Maybe what you need today is, is prayer for something that man, was brought up in service or that you're processing right now. If that's you, come to the left of stage. We'd love to pray for you before you leave here today. And uh, if you're new here, just trying to get connected here at Grace and maybe you went to Easter and this is your second time back, stop by the tent on the way out. You'll see it on the sidewalk as you go. We'd love to meet you just for a moment before you leave here tonight. But thanks so much for being here. God bless. We'll see you back here next week.